The invitation will be 404 at the bottom if you want to hold that, 404. Now let's come together and meet our Lord and Savior at his table. Communion song 410, 410. Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flowed from Calvary's mountain, in the cross, shall find rest beyond the river near the cross I'll watch and wait helping trusting ever till I reach the golden strand just Beyond the river, in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. The Old Law, a law, a set of laws given to Moses, and was a covenant to his people that if they stayed faithful, he would always be with them. Under this old law, it was an imperfect standard, because under this law, there was no removal of sin and no true satisfaction unto God. In Colossians 2.14, it says, Jesus nailed the old law to the cross with him, but why? And I believe that's answered in Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 14. It says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they have not ceased to be offered, because that, because that the worshipers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh in the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings and offering, for sin would thou, is, would thou wouldest not. Neither had his pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered, offered once one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. After reading this, one would think that God had panicked and had to make a new plan B because the old law wasn't enough. But ironically, this was all part of the plan from the foundation of everything. 
God was searching and Jesus was willing. He didn't see it as a burden to come and die, as we definitely would. And God didn't hold back on making his only son a sacrifice, as each father and each parent would hear today. This proves that God has always loved you from the beginning of the world to the Israelites turning their backs on him time and time again to the Jews mocking and beating his son and killing him. He wanted to give you a chance, a chance to experience a love that no one on this earth can give and an end result that we can never imagine. The more I read and study and the longer I live, the more I realize that everything God has done is out of love. He sent his son out of love, and he tarries his coming because he wants to see more people become Christians and have eternal life with him in heaven one day. Jesus paid the ultimate, ultimate sacrifice for you and for me, his body broken and his blood shed. And all that he commands us to do is to obey and share his word and love one another. So as we gather around this table, be aware that he took your place. And he endured the pain and the torture all out of love. I'd ask the elders to pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. And we do thank you for the love that you have for us, dear God. The great love that you had for us. And where you showed us that love, dear God. For you did send your son Jesus to the cross. No one took his life, God. As, as it tells us in your word, he gave it. He freely gave his life for us. He endured the cross. He shed his blood that we could have forgiveness of our sins. As we come around this table this morning, dear God, help us all to clear our thoughts and our minds and to think back to that, to remember the sacrifice that was made for us, to remember the great love that was shown for us. And we do thank you and just ask you to continue to be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Father in heaven, as we continue in prayer, we're so thankful the opportunity to be here this morning, Lord. We praise your name today and give you credit for all. We ask God that you'll bless this service this morning. Thank you for Brett. Be with him as he brings our message today, Lord. Bless him and his family. Thank you, Father, for his boys, the way they do things for us here in church. They're just wonderful boys and wonderful family. Thank you for each one else that's here today, God. Bless them in a special way for being in your house. May they be blessed by being here. We thank you, Father, for this time that we have to come around your table. We ask God that you'll bless this cup, which is your son's shed blood. Forgive us now when we fail you. Now help us always to live for you each day of our lives, Lord. It's my prayer in your son's name. Amen.
this offering that we're about to collect is not your money. It, it isn't yours. It's something that God has provided you with um, to be able to provide uh, for the things that you need. And that's something that we should realize in giving this back to God, which he, he doesn't need it, but he deserves it. Um, so, Teddy, I ask that you would bless the offering. For the opening scripture, it's going to be out of Psalms 34 and 17 and 18. It says, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and, deli and delivereth them out of their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save us such as be of a contrite spirit. Good morning. It is good to be in the Lord's house this morning. Glad that you're here. Hope you're here for the right purpose, which is to worship and to praise Him. Uh, that's why we're to be gathered around this table and forsaken not the assembly. In doing that, we discourage one another and are not here to encourage and to lift up. Uh going to jump right into my message because Christmas is just right around the corner and uh, everywhere you look it seems all you see in the faces and the actions of people are people of broken dreams uh, people of a sad gloomy countenance as if in their lives they have no hope and I hate to say that you see that in a lot of Christians' faces and their actions and their attitudes as if they live a life without any hope. Uh, there are a lot of things in this life that can contribute to a broken heart. There are the, lo the loss of a loved one. Many know that experience. Maybe the loss of a job. Maybe a relationship that's lost its spark and it feels empty. Maybe it's the loss of a friendship that you once enjoyed. Stresses of life. There are a lot of things that can hurt us. When we face the times in life where our heart is broken... 
We have to decide if we're going to get up and move forward. We have to decide if we're going to press on and live the life that the Lord Jesus Christ died to give us. A broken heart, if it's not mended, will cause us to uh, not live joyfully, will keep us from enjoying life, keep us in the prison of depression if we're not very careful. It can make us hate others, not feel a love for those that love us, reject even the love of those that love us. Cause us to focus only on the negative things of this life and it'll cause us to loathe the happiness that others experience. But a broken heart something that doesn't have to be permanent. It isn't something that has to go on and on and manifest in the cruel, unfair, things of life. When things get tough, I understand it seems like it will never end. Have you ever thought, my goodness, what's next? What can come next? It's so bad it's got worse. What do I have to endure? What's around the next being? Isaiah was a prophet from Judah for about 60 years. It was a very tough time for the nation. They had been invaded by the Assyrians, then invaded and taken captive, taken away by the Babylonians. I want you to see if you could imagine real quick living in that time when two massive cruel armies come into your country, come into your city, come into your little towns. You reckon the spirit of these people are at a low point? But well, we know by reading in Isaiah that they were. When people are at a low point, suffering from a broken heart, they have a tendency to think that all is over. All is lost. Ain't nothing worth living for tomorrow. We feel hopeless. We don't want to reject it again, so we give up. We lay down. We quit. We're no longer following the course. For life, we can feel, has no meaning, no purpose, a broken heart is truly a very dark emotion because most of the times those of a broken heart isolate themselves, keep themselves away, and they suffer alone. In 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I want you to listen to what it says here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 3 says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of what? Oh, I thought He was the Father of the uh, depression, the Father of hate, the Father of the scowl, that everywhere you go and everybody uh, just despise and hate. See, that's why a lot of Christians seem to walk through that door. The way a lot of Christians seem to act and go on outside this door. But it says here, he ain't the God of that, the Father of that. He's the Father of mercies and the God of all what? Do we act like a people that are comforted? Do we act like a people that uh, God's taken care of and blessed us greatly? 
Or is all we get done is complaining and hating and griping and fussing? And we look at whoever we can to come up with a reason not to be comforted. It says here that he's a God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulations. Why? So that we can turn around and be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the same comfort where we ourselves are comforted of God. But if you walk around with a broken heart, in other words, you ain't good for nothing in the Lord's kingdom. Do you understand that? If you're going to walk around with a broken heart and stay with a broken heart, then you're not allowing God to comfort you, which means you can't turn around and comfort somebody else in the kingdom of God makes one worthless. Do you hear that? Nothing wrong with having a broken heart, but living with it. You're of no good to God's kingdom. Because he can't comfort you, John, if you won't allow him to. And then you are of no service to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because you can't comfort them, for you have not allowed God to comfort you. What this tells me is that Christians, we don't have to suffer alone when our heart's broken, when things are not good, when there are issues and problems. We don't have to suffer alone. We can go to God and we receive what? Comfort. He says he is the God of all comfort. That means in every situation and every reason, God has what you need. All you got to do is take it. All you got to do is accept it. And then be a comfort to others. No, no. The heart doesn't have to be broken forever. Not the Christian's heart. Isaiah 61. Turn with me to Isaiah 61. This is part of Isaiah's prophecy concerning the life of the coming Messiah, the work of the coming Messiah, that being Jesus. Isaiah is writing here to encourage the children of God, people who were dealing with a broken heart, people who were cast down, people at the end of their rope over their captivity. He's writing to let them know God has a plan and everything will get better. Do you believe that in your life? That God has a plan and no matter what you're going through now, everything's going to get better if our attitude's right about it. If our attitude's right about it and we allow God to be our all comfort. Well, this is what Isaiah is saying. Look at uh, chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. I'll read 3 also. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the what? Brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty instead of ashes for the head, all of joy instead of mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Why? That he might be glorified. Do you know that Isaiah is talking about the coming of Jesus here? Do you know that? Isaiah is talking about the coming of Jesus to bring peace, 
joy, encouragement, love, happiness, all of these things, Isaiah says it's Jesus coming to fix the broken heart. And do you know Jesus knew Isaiah said this? Do you know that? Jesus knew Isaiah said that. Look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. In verse 17. And a book was brought to Jesus. And that book was of the prophet Isaiah. And when Jesus opened the book, he went and found the place where this was written. Uh, this may sound familiar to you. The place which Jesus read said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering the sight of the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach of the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus then closed the book, gave it back to the minister, sat down, and all eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And you know what he said? This scripture, which I just read out of Isaiah a while ago, that Jesus just reread here in Luke 4, he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Jesus says, I'm the one. I am the one to preach the gospel to the poor. I am the one to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, Recovering the sight of the blind and set at liberty them that are bruised. Jesus said, Isaiah said that, and he's talking about me. And Jesus is still here to do the same today. He's still here to deliver. He's still here to direct. He's still, he's still here to give hope. Listen, when we're facing difficult times, when our heart is broken, we need to understand we can turn to Jesus for comfort. Jesus is the Son of God, the God of all comfort. And Jesus said, I came to deliver. I came to give. I came to provide. Isaiah tells us that he came to bind up the brokenhearted, to pro uh, proclaim liberty to the captives. So in other words, God doesn't want us to suffer in this old prison of a broken heart. And that's what it can put you in, prison. A broken heart, shattered dreams, can take your life and turn you upside down and make you a bitter, uh, uh, hateful, hate-filled individual if you are not careful. And God doesn't want us in that prison. God doesn't want us walking around with a broken heart about whatever our life circumstances may be about what has happened to us. Psalms 147 verse 3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. If you cut yourself real bad while you're working in the garden, have an accident and you're bleeding out, does a doctor come running to you to fix you? Or you got to get in the car and you got to go to the doctor? You got, to, you got to get in the car and you got to go, right? If you're tired of being down and out, if you're tired of feeling like you've got a broken heart and life ain't worth living, that the stresses of this life just ain't worth it, you need to go to the doctor. And Isaiah said, Jesus is the one that's come to bound you up. Jesus is the one to come to heal the wounds. Jesus is the one that's come to release you. We need to realize that whatever causes our broken hearts, God can heal it. But you've got to be willing to be healed. You've got to want to be healed. Now this, back here in Isaiah 61, and then what Jesus went over in Luke 4, this is in direct context to those that were suffering oppression at that time, captives, 
of Babylon. But the future reference that we see here and what Jesus then brought up there in Luke was that what Jesus could do for those that were captives to sin. And listen, the greatest fight, I was telling somebody the other day, that the devil, the biggest thing the devil goes over to control and win is your mind. If he has control of your mind, he's going to whip you. And he's going to control everything else about your life. He will beat you down with your own brain if we don't go to the Lord for healing. And then we'd live in sin. But Jesus came to release us as captives to sin. Many times people that are Christians and even people that are looking outside into what we are as Christians think that a life in Christ is a life of no, no. Is a life of oh, you cannot. Is a life of oh, do not. But in reality, if I, unless I misread it right, it says Jesus came to give us liberty. Liberty. From sin, from the consequences of sin, if we live right and live for Him. Psalms 34 18. I believe that's what Jonah read this morning. It said, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He's near to you. He don't want you to stay that way. But when you're brokenhearted and you're down, you need to recover and you need strength to get back up and to go. Guess who's there for you, Christian? The Lord is. And when you say, help me, Lord, strengthen me, Lord, direct me, Lord, get me right, Lord, he's going to do it because he's right there to do just that. He's there for the brokenhearted. And God can heal you if you let him. We're not supposed to walk around with a permanent broken heart. You read through the Old Testament scripture, you find time and again. They say, why is your countenance slow? God would say, what are you down there for? Get up. Throw your chest out. Live life. We're not to waller, but for a short time. And I look at David when his little baby died. Of course, it was a death due to his sin and his choices. He prayed in ashes and wallowed until the news came that that baby didn't make it, that the baby died. You know what David done? You remember what it said he did right after that? He got up, washed himself off, put on nice clothes, and said, bring me something to eat. It was time to get up and go. The broken heart period is time to start getting better. It's time to start pressing forward. It's time to change the countenance, the look of depression and anguish and pain. It's time for that to be done, John. And life was to go on. And God can help us with that when we need it. The broken heart's not supposed to be positive. Life goes on if you allow it to. Look back there at verse 3 real quick in Isaiah 61 and verse 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty. Instead of ashes on the forehead, showing you were mourning and of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Instead of that, he says, you're going to have a beautiful headdress. Not ashes upon your head. Let's keep reading. All of joy instead of mourning. Garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that you might be called trees of righteousness, planted by the Lord. Why? That he'll be glorified. In other words, he's telling the people here, hey, life's going to change for you if you'll allow it to. If you'll live like you should, and you live for the Lord, and you set your mind right, things are going to be okay. You get that ashes wiped off. Not going to be in mourning anymore but you're going to be as a solid oak tree 
the oak tree of righteousness that the Lord planted so that you can turn around and give him praise and glory and honor for deliverance, for help, for mercy, for joy, for peace, for all things that are beautiful. Tell you what, when your heart's broken, how do you feel? Do you feel victorious when your heart's broken? You feel like you can take on the world when your heart's broken? I'd better say about everybody in there's had a broken heart from one thing or another, or maybe many, many times. Well, the last thing you feel is victorious. The last thing you feel is like going out and conquering the world. Most of the time in a a broken heart, we feel less than confident, don't we? We feel less than loved. We feel less than a desire to love. I actually feel like we'll never be happy again. Never going to succeed at anything again. Well, that's not how it has to be. Because my Bible instructs me that in Jesus Christ, we are victorious. In Jesus Christ, we have succeeded. In Jesus Christ, we have overcome sin. We have overcome an eternal death, and now we can have eternal life in Jesus Christ. That sounds pretty positive to me, as long as we let Jesus lead us, control our lives through him by his work. Look what Isaiah told those of the brokenhearted, told those that were suffering. He says, you're going to have... Get away, get out of the ashes, beautiful headdress. Beauty is going to be seen in your face. Not ashes of depression and ashes of heartbreak and ashes of mourning. No, when people look at you, they're going to see something beautiful. Because the Lord has freed you. He's given you joy in the place of all those things. Ain't no doubt when we're, our hearts broke, we're experiencing grief. But comes a time, a short time, that God replaces that grief with joy and with happiness, with a peaceful soul. We can also experience joy in the midst of difficult times. That's possible when we realize God's in control, not us. Most of the times, our heart's broken when me or someone around me decides they're in control. That's when everything goes to pot. That's when everything is destroyed and goes upside down. When we realize that God is in control and we need to follow his lead, we're nowhere near as brokenhearted as often. We're nowhere near as disappointed and sad and depressed and down when we realize God's in control and that every situation... God can use for your good. Everything that happens, God can use for your good. And that causes us to get up, get the ashes wiped off of us, put on our good clothes, wash our faces, and do what me and Martin and John did yesterday. And that's it. And eat good. That's what David did. You know why David did that? Because David realized God was in control now. He'd done what he could do on his part. And now it's time to God and time for him to move on. I no doubt God can remove the broken heart. Promise to replace it with all of gladness. It's possible because of our relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Look what it said there, a garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, instead of a destroyed spirit, instead of a downcast spirit. So he give us a spirit of praise. When we're down, our spirit's weak. God wants to give us a spirit of boldness. Success. You have a positive attitude and a positive outlook. For in God, all things are positive. Can you all think of one negative thing about God? One. Tell me one negative thing about God. 
There ain't one negative thing about following God, but yet we can always, just at the drop of a hat, be a negative people, can we not? When our God is not negative in any way. And he don't want you to be neither. He wants you to be as a planted tree of righteousness, bringing him glory in everything you do. Goodness, don't let a broken heart have dominion over your life. Right in the middle of a broken heart, things ain't going right. You just feel life's over. Good for nothing. But in Christ, it doesn't have to be that way. Romans, the sixth chapter is where I'm going to end. I must have got started real early today. I've done good. Of course, it ain't finished yet, neither am I. This is what Romans, the sixth chapter, says. And while you're turning around, let me say, I don't think that you and I have it within our own power to overcome a broken heart. I don't think we've got in our own power to overcome depression, anxiety, to overcome issues and problems in which we face, fears of life today and of what life could be tomorrow. I don't think we have power to overcome that ourselves. But in Jesus Christ, I know we do because the Bible tells me so. With him, we can do all things. Without him, we can do what? Nothing. So it's really important to be in Christ and be alive, not to walk in dead. This is what it says in Romans, the sixth chapter, verse three. Speaking to Christians, he says, Do you not know that you that were baptized into Jesus Christ, that you'd been baptized into his death? Therefore, we're buried by baptism into death. Now, Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also be raised out of baptism to walk in newness of what? Life. Kind of like David in the ashes praying for that little baby and mourning for that sick baby. Come a time he had to get up and have life move forward. We go in baptism. That old man of sin is destroyed. We rise to walk in a new life in Jesus Christ. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, that's in baptism, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. He said there, knowing this in verse 6, that our old man is crucified in baptism by the blood of Jesus Christ with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. In other words, we're raised to a newness of life, to live it in Jesus Christ. He that is dead is freed from sin. If he be dead with Christ in baptism, believing that we should also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more. Death hath no dominion over him. Nothing has dominion over him. Jesus was raised from the grave to live forevermore. When we're baptized, that old man of sin is put to death. We're raised to live a new life forevermore. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he what? Liveth. He liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves also to be dead indeed to sin. But what? Alive in Jesus Christ to God through the death and resurrection of the Son of, of God, Jesus Christ. So let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. I'm telling you what, when we let things of this earth and conditions of this earth drag us down and keep us down there, that's sin. you got to rise up. You got to press forward, move forward, living to God through Jesus Christ. Did you get that out of what we just read there? I did. 
And I know better than anybody, it's easy to be cut off at the knees. It's easier to waller than it is to get up. But I don't like to waller. I like to get up and move forward because you know what? I've got a God. You never know what he's got in store for you the very next second. You ain't got a clue. And that's kind of how we live our lives, how I want to live my life, how you need to live your life is waiting on God to work in your life through your faithful obedience to his word. We can have confidence that he will. Amen? Amen. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. Listen, if you're outside Christ, if you're not a Christian, if you haven't come to God through the blood of Jesus Christ in baptism, you don't have these promises of comfort and joy and peace and everlasting life. You don't have that. If you don't have a relationship to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. So why? Why destroy yourself daily? Limit your happiness and your peace and your joy daily just because you're not a Christian when it's so easy and it's so simple. This hymn of invitation we sing this morning to give you the chance to come. We ask that you do. We'll stand and sing verse 1.